Welcome to this webinar that has been organized by the Natural Hazard Early Career Scientist Team of the European Geoscience Union. Uh, the title of this webinar is, is Ready to be a Great Conference Presenters. Presenter, we have today three great speakers with us, Dion Afner, Diana Vieira, and Miai Nicolita, that are going to share with us some uh, interesting uh, tips about this topic. Very briefly, I'm going to introduce you uh, our group, the Natural Hazard Early Career Scientist Team is a very active uh, team of young uh, researchers. We do a lot of different activities in our group. We co-organize sessions, short courses, and activities during the EGU General Assembly. We do a blogging. We have an active, uh, interesting blog, NH uh, uh, blog uh, inside the uh, framework of the EGU uh, blogs. Uh, we create, do we organize a lot of activities related to networking, uh, to create scientific collaborations and to share knowledge among us. And we organize, of course, also a series of outreach activities such as campfires and webinars as the one that we are following today. Uh, we are uh, open to, to, um, to meet new people. We would be re really happy if you are an early career scientist involved in the uh, field of natural hazards, feel free to send an email to this email address that is uh, ecs-nh at egu.eu and ask to join our Slack workspace uh, and be involved in our, in our activities. Uh, now, very briefly, a disclaimer before starting with our presentations. Uh, in the, let's say, advertisement of today's seminar, we um, mentioned the fact that we were addressing issues related to the presentation of posters and VPCO uh, sessions. But of course, as you probably already know, this year's EGU uh, is not, uh, um, say, foreseen to have posters and WPCO presentations, but only uh, in-person or online short oral presentations. And so why we mentioned anyway these formats, but for several reasons. The first one is that the seminar can be also valid for other conferences, of course, so in general to be ready to be a presenter, not only for EGU but also the fact that some of the tips can be still be useful also for this year's EGU format and you will, you will see it during the presentations. And last but not least, we hope that next EGU will include these formats again. So we really hope to be again all together to discuss in front of our posters. As for any question during the webinar, please use the chat. Um, and then we will have a Q&A uh, session at the end where we can discuss together. So uh, I think that we can start with the presentation. So our first speaker is Dion Hapner, that is a PhD student in physical oceanography at the University of Copenhagen and a sucker for effective communication. His qualifications include a low tolerance for boring presentations and an outstanding student and PhD candidate presentation award from EGU in 2021. So I leave the floor to Dion that is going to talk about uh, Painless science posters. Please, Dion, the floor, floor yeah. is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I think you need to stop sharing so I can share. Okay, here we go. Um, let's see. Okay. Yeah, so this should be it. Um, let me know if you can see it. So, um, posters. Well, we just heard there will be no posters at uh, EGU this year. I think a lot of this advice also applies to short presentations because it's it's kind of the same niche. You have very limited space. You have like one slide or so, or a few slides, just like in a poster, and you really need to make the best of the resources that are given to you. And uh, I think, I hope I can give you some some useful advice for that. So if you've never been to a poster session, it kind of looks like this here in the background. You are the scientist in front of your of your big poster and there are people walking around and um, looking at the posters. There's usually a train of people uh, rotating and um, then you hopefully have a, a good conversation. Um, 
it's kind of a, an awkward format really and i i share a, a love hate relationship with it i think it can be really beautiful and you can have fantastic discussions but there's also a, a lot to be improved let's say um in poster sessions and in the design of posters which i think is the hardest part about it so i will focus on that so how do you design design a good poster while not going insane in the process well let me show you how I would do it. Um, first up, one thing out of the way. So what is a poster good for? It's there to promote you and pretty much nothing else. The intended outcome after the post session is people should be impressed by you, hopefully, or intrigued by your research, look it up, cite your stuff, reach out to you for collaborations or give you feedback on your research. But this also requires that you convince them that you're worth giving feedback to. So it's really a, a promotion for yourself, first and foremost, and also for your research. So you should really try to put your, your best foot forward and um, impress people with your amazing poster. So let's see. Uh, the life cycle of a poster, I think it's important to think about what do we even want to achieve and then how do we achieve it? So first up, during the poster session, this is what people mostly have in mind when they think about designing a poster. So it should work during the poster session. So here we have the scientists in front of their poster and uh, some, some, someone in the audience reading the poster or trying to figure out what is on the poster and what is being presented. Now the goal here is to have a discussion with this person because only through this personal interaction do we really uh, create this bond that will allow you to connect later or to, to collaborate. So the goal is to have a discussion. So what you do not want people is to read your poster in silence for 10 minutes, then maybe ask a question or two or, and go on or just lose patience and, and go on immediately. So really the key quantity here is time to engagement so you want people to come over, look at your poster and go immediately, wow, that looks amazing. Can we talk about this and really get the conversation going? And, and it takes out all this awkwardness of people reading it in, in, in silence and you're standing there like mm -hmm, waiting for them to, to say anything. It's, it's really uh, something that you want to avoid. So you, you should design your poster so someone can immediately see what's on it and start discussing it without reading too much. On the other hand, you should also have enough detail on the poster that you can have a nuanced discussion. So you want to be able to go in depth, but not at, as the very first step. And we will get back to that. There's another important thing uh, after the poster session, usually your poster is left in the exhibition hall without you being there. And then uh, just going to be people walking through it uh, between talks or when they have to, to pass some time. And uh, it's still gonna be there. So the poster should also work in this setting where people just walk by. And here it is a bit of a different um, metrics or targets that you, you want to reach. So it should be interesting enough for people to stop and it should be self-contained enough for them to kind of understand what you're going for and maybe even reach out um, to you afterwards. And it should of course include your contact details so people can do this. So you should really think hard about how you want to design your poster so it works in both of these settings. And now there's a final stage in the, in the life cycle of a poster, which is the garbage bin. So most posters uh, are very, pretty short lived. They might be in the hallway and if your institute is eye candy or so, but ultimately that it's just a day or two where it's really relevant. So don't don't go overboard, don't spend weeks on, on designing and tweaking your poster because it's just gonna end up in the bin anyway. Um, yeah, so just, just so we're on the same page, this is kind of the setting or like the, yeah, where we really want our poster to work. Okay, so now about uh, designing and, and I have three rules for you. Um, no one, taught me this is like my, my own thoughts on the, on the subject matter. So if you decide that these don't work for you, then it's fine. Uh, just some, some food for thought maybe. And I think good poster design is fractal. So what does that mean? 
you should have the low level details like what is my poster about the elephant in the room should take the most space on your poster so if your poster is about bees or the genetic of bees then if you don't put a picture of a bee and a, like a double helix on there you kind of have lost already because you want people to be able to intuitively grasp what the poster is about just by looking at it and not reading it it's this time for to engagement thing so th this is what i call framing so this should take the most space on your poster and then um, you go down into more and more detail but this detail should also take less and less visual space on your poster so this is uh, depth and the far down you go in depth is, is kind of what you tweak to your audience and to the format if you have a very short presentation or so then you can't go in depth if you there's a lot of experts at the, the conference you will need to include more detail but you cannot skip intermediate steps here so you should always have the full funnel of framing what is what is this about the, in a way that your grandmother can can see it um, then your main results should take the next most amount of visual space then you give evidence for your for your main results and then you give details that you can use during the discussion to point to but these details don't have to be understandable for someone just reading the poster it doesn't matter and i think you should receive it's also good to have a poster that looks good i think uh, people will will usually find that more attractive uh, okay so that was rule number one um and a very easy way i think to achieve this is this template called better poster you can google it and there are youtube talks and there are uh, talks on youtube there are blog posts about it there's the template you can download um it's not the only way by far but i think it's a pretty easy way this like three block structure where you have the results in the middle and it take up 80 percent of the space and then you have uh, details and plots and, and figures on the sides. Mm. So if you're not a very creative person or you feel overwhelmed, then you can just start with this and, and uh, roll with it. And usually the, the results turn out fine. Now the, the second rule, and I think it's almost as important, is uh, show is better than tell. So you could write a whole paragraph about how your data processing works or, or what you do to your uh, how your, your study works, or you can draw up a diagram and actually show how it works. And this takes about the same amount of space, but the paragraph on the left-hand side is not understandable unless you read it. And on the right-hand side, if someone is already familiar with your topic, they will look at it and immediately know what, you, what you've done uh, without having to spend time to read it. And I think this is such a powerful thing that also really minimizes this time to engagement or the time uh, they spend reading the poster. And it makes it more intriguing. It's, it's a win for everyone, really. Uh, it helps you to be clearer on, on communicating your science. And uh, really, a picture is worth uh, so much more than, than a thousand words on your poster. So really, just try. You can draw this up in, in PowerPoint or whatever, um, or Inkscape or whatever you want to use, and then just put it on there, it's gonna be great. Um, rule number three, now this is a kind of a hot take, but I think um, you should never use LaTeX to do posters. Um, I, I drive this point home with a little meme. So you have the, the Neanderthal here, it's, who says, well, just use PowerPoint for your poster. Then, uh, the advanced guy who says, uh, well, you need to use LaTeX because it's so great and everything is automatic and the layouts are fantastic. And uh, the expert which says, just use PowerPoint. Um, so kind of my, what my point is that all of these things that make LaTeX great, they don't matter for posters. It doesn't matter if, if your, your blocks are perfectly aligned. It doesn't matter if you don't need float placement. Basically, the only thing you need that LaTeX really supports well is, is equations. But you can, I mean, unless you're in a math heavy field, you have like three or four equations, you can just draw these up in PowerPoint or, or Keynote or whatever. Uh, so none of these things matter. And I mean, instead of PowerPoint, you can use any visual tool that you are familiar with. And usually that is like a presentation tool. So I use Keynote personally. 
and I think it works well for me. And it, it takes like two minutes to, to draw up like a better poster. So three blocks and a little bit of text and then mostly pictures. Um, I hope I'm not running out of time. Uh, I, will, I wanted to show you some examples of what I mean. Uh, so this is the poster that, that I won an award with last year at EGU. Um, so it kind of takes this this better poster idea. Uh, it does. I don't follow it strictly, but like yeah, just be inspired by it. So you have three blocks, and in, in the middle are really your results. This is what you want people to take home, and then um, the rest is mostly pictures with labels. So if you put the labels on that in our fractal design framework, uh, then all of these things are like framing. So the like this time series and there's this world map over here. It really helps people to look at the poster from a distance and, and say, understand what it's about. Um, then you really have to include narrative in a way. So I really like to, to draw arrows between things. So people see how things are connected visually, super helpful. And um, put your results really in the middle. It, Sometimes you don't have results, that's fine. But if you've just written a paper or something and you do have results, just put it in the middle, show with arrows what your, your evidence is for your claims. And then it becomes uh, very obvious for the audience of how your, your narrative hangs together. And don't forget to promote yourself and put your contact details and your papers on there. Another example, it's kind of the same, same idea, also just, block structure now a bit a uh, bit different with the, the block on the left but yeah all, all of these things like put a python logo on there if, if you use if you're doing like a programming project or so put curves on there if you're using benchmarks it really helps people to understand what it's about at a glance and then uh, the last example now that you know the rules uh, you can also break them um, so this doesn't have results uh, very prominently this has a lot of framing and this is just something where I wanted to go bananas a bit and uh, design something that's more exciting. Ultimately, a poster is really also a part of your personality that you want to showcase. So I think, um, yeah, just having some fun and then doing something that you find visually appealing is also very nice. Just don't overdo the text. It should really be only pictures with labels um, and then you're probably gonna be fine. Um, this has lots of narrative. I didn't have strong results here so it has no main findings it's mostly about like this journey from from a to z and um yeah uh, last rule is don't take it too seriously just have fun be creative don't get bogged down in tools or whatnot just just uh yeah have a lot of pictures and uh, uh, then you will have a great discussion with people doing your poster session and hopefully meet, meet a lot of interesting people all right, and if you have any questions, just uh, post it in the Q and A, and I'm happy to uh, discuss with you. Thank you very much, Dion, for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, see if I can. Yeah, great. Uh, I don't know why my camera. Uh, okay, no, it's not working anymore. Okay, yeah, now it's working. Great, so thank you very much for your presentation. I hope that there will be some questions to answer later. So I would like now to pass to the second speakers of today is Diana Vieira. Diana is a researcher at the Joint Research Center at the European Commission within the European Soil Observatory. Diana did a PhD in Environmental Sciences and Engineering in 2015 at the University of Aveiro. Um, and during her research path, she was the principal investigator, is investigator of the FEM project. Inside this European Soil Observatory, she is dedicated to large-scale post-fire soil erosion modeling, land degradation, healthy soils, and the assessment, fate, and remediation of soil pollution in e European uh, soils. Uh, furthermore, um, um, this year, if I remember well, uh, Diana received the Soil System Science Division Outstanding Early Career Scientist Award. So, uh, Diana, the floor is yours uh, with your presentation about uh, storytelling your research. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, I'll share my screen now. Thank you for the long <laughs> presentation. 
I'm just uh, Diana. You can call me just by Diana. And I just want to bring um, a little bit of what I think it could be important for you when you do uh, a presentation, when you plan your presentation. And basically, I call it storytelling your research because I think that uh, you have to find, uh, deli uh, delineate a little path in your uh, presentation. I try to, clean, uh, to keep this presentation very clean, very sober, because I really wanted you to focus on the essential. So when I was planning this uh, presentation, I thought about what could be the most important items that you should use uh, when, the, when you're planning your presentation. And I had more, but in the end, because I only have 10 minutes, I decided to basically that um, uh, audience, story, design, place, and practice uh, are the, the ones that I give more importance. And I think that uh, you'll later understand why. So basically, um, because uh, I know that most of, uh, and especially the young researchers, are mostly used to give presentations to only to other researchers, you have to think that now and in the future, Possibly, you will give presentations to stakeholders and policymakers also. So there is an important uh, um, adjustment in the vocabulary that you need to do according to the audience that you have. So basically, for instance, it will be important in a session like EGU, if you give a presentation that you specifically say your research question and specifically mention your methods so your audience your colleagues uh, see your presentation and uh, see if their personal works are related and are comparable to yours however when we go to the stakeholder type of uh, presentation perhaps these ones can be replaced by more what does my novelty in my my novel research can contribute as a solution for it's a solution for the environment or applicability and if the solution that i found it can be uh, oper uh, operationalized in a larger scale and finally and with ag again with an adjustment of the vocabulary if you give a presentation for policymakers, they might not know anything about your research. They might be very far away from your reality. So you have to make a good adjustment. And in the end, uh, find a good uh, take home message. For instance, uh, a policymaker, because it needs to create new laws. Uh, if you find uh, I'll give an example, a huge impact over uh, certain characteristics or a certain industry or a certain environment, you should say it precisely uh, as a take home message. And perhaps don't give that much details on the methods, but more on the what does this mean for the entire society. So basically, I framed it like this and I pick up a little bit of our what is our structure on the on our publication. So basically, uh, if you go to this uh, left uh, corner when we tell, uh, tell about our uh, when you make an introduction of your publication for instance you go for your introduction objectives of your work and then somewhere in the middle you have your research question you have the problem definition i suggest you could start the storytelling like that and then go to your materials and methods go to your results and applicability here's already a little bit of discussion Here's something more on discussion, pros and cons, uncertainties where we have our errors. And finally, finishing the presentation with the answer to the question. So basically, you have an answer in the beginning, a story to tell, and a reply in the end. I kind of uh, translated this to my own research, like um, once upon a time, there was a wildfire and a flood happened. And then the P 
people in the downstream of the burnt area realized they had a huge impact. And basically, uh, they asked themselves, what will be the consequences of this? Will this happen again? For how long am I in risk, for instance? And then this wild scientist goes and tries to solve the problem and decided, so I'm going to solve that problem. So I did a field work or a lab or a model experiment to tackle that problem. And then in the end, he found out that actually those people that live in those locations, if they suffer upstream of their areas, wildfires with higher severity, they are more likely to have ex an extreme wild uh, uh, rainfall events. They very likely will have flooding happening there in their location. And moreover, and I think you recognize this, our experiment is quite comparable to our colleagues, researchers from uh, another place in the world. Uh, but we have to be a little bit careful also because we also don't know that under other rainfall conditions, for instance, these results might not apply. And here comes the end of your story. Well, but most of all, in the end, we realized that there are, uh, the impacts of fire are noticeable on soil and water for several years, and that you need to be prepared and mitigated for that. And then they leave him formed happily ever after, let's say it like that. And here you have a story. It's a typical science, uh, scientific uh, uh, procedure, let's say uh, product of a publication, but you're just framing it in the way that it makes uh, a lot of sense. And it's a kind of a romanticized way of telling a story. Then I also th thought, because I also don't have much time, that perhaps uh, other items could be important for you to think when you're planning, for instance, uh, many of them, uh, they must have been said by other colleagues to you uh, previously, but structure, color and format uh, in order that people can read some of the things are important in presentations. I would like to call your attention to the fact that when you use images, try to use colors that are inclusive. There's a lot of publications online on what are the best colors uh, uh, especially for people uh, uh, that are colorblind and they cannot uh, uh, interpret the, the images in the same way as, uh, that you do. So that, that is an important thing. And the, the point of the structure is very clear for me. If I suddenly change the structure of the presentation to something else out of the sudden, then you lose the attention or uh, because you were framed in the previous slides to have a black and white or gray type of scene and suddenly you have something else mixed up and you even have uh, different formats in letters and people, uh, the persons need to follow your uh, uh, your talk but in the end they also get a little bit distracted for whatever is happening. Okay, but then two more items and I, I'm, uh, I'm almost uh, um, finishing. You have to take into consideration if you're making a classic presentation in a conference, in a classic conference in a room, or even if it's a poster like our colleague, if it's online, if it's a small meeting, for instance, it's acceptable online that I look to the computer all the time and I have the presentation in front of me. But you, in the amphitheater, I think it's very good that you look to people, try to maintain eye contact and absolutely breathe, okay? Try to breathe and relax. I know it can be stressful for some of the young researchers or early stage uh, career uh, researchers, but I think there's a space for you to relax and uh, 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 and to enjoy your presentation. And for that, you need to be, you need to test your presentation, try to see if you can control the things a little bit. In a small meeting, like if you are presenting for a stakeholder or you want to try to explain something uh, to your research team, um, I would rather, for instance,
practice advise you to have an interaction, like interrupt the presentation, have a continuous flow of conversation that I think it can be very, very useful for you and also to relax a little bit. Okay, so finally, practice. I gave some time to practice. I was practicing yesterday and I realized that I didn't have a, that a, I was going beyond the 10 minutes of presentation. <laughs> so I had to remove some slides. So basically, I think that we need to take that into consideration also uh, that you need to be responsible in the conference like EGU to make sure you fulfill your time in order that your colleague after you doesn't have to suffer that much uh, trying to squeeze their time in the one that uh, you already lost. Another thing is the voice. I use my first two slides to set up the tone of my voice in the beginning. I might be shaky, I might be nervous, I might be, but I use two comfortable slides always in the beginning to make sure my voice is set. And those are, I think, essential things, but only you can only get them by experience, I guess. And questions, you can have questions. So you better be prepared to answer those questions. And most of all, be very polite when answering back. Some of the questions are, might be questions that you don't want to hear. But uh, once you're in the stage, you have the, the power to reply accordingly and well. Okay, so I just leave here three final remarks. Uh, regarding the main topics, basically storytelling is very good because it allows you to better engage with the audience. I like very clean and organized presentations so that I don't get dispersed by content or oh, uh, too much content. And I think that being prepared is the most important thing for a good presentation. And I think this is it. I hope you like it. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Diana, for this presentation. I'm now trying to, let me see. Okay, great. Great, so uh, again, I hope that we will have time to discuss a bit uh, uh, into the Q&A session with you. Uh, so now I leave the floor to the, our last but not least speaker, Miai Nicolita, geographer, associate professor in geomorphology and natural hazards and physical geography at the uh, UA current the EGU natural hazard outstanding student and PhD uh, candidate uh, uh, presentation coordinator and executive committee member of the International Society for Geomorphometry. He's an open science publishing software and data access enthusiast. And today in his presentation, Miai will illustrate us this ERIG format and we will explain us about the uh, OSPP competition. So let's enter into the EGU format uh, topic with you, Miai, please. Thank you, Silvia. Uh, hello, everybody. Dear colleagues, I'm not so young anymore, but anyway, uh, I am involved in this OSPP um, uh, thing at EGU for the Natural Hazards Commission uh, Division. Sorry. So I will explain you something about uh, this award, these awards, and uh, their evolution because you need to understand it. Uh, understand it. Uh, the um, uh, OSPP means Outstanding Students and PhD Candidate Presentation Awards. You will see that there was an evolution, but anyway, uh, the young, let's say the uh, under PhD level uh, and PhD included was kept over the years. The rationale was to promote posters and picos for this huge uh, scientific event, but also this uh, is very important for young people uh, to foster their excitement, yes, so to, uh, to give them credit for, for the work. Uh, there are up to six awards for every division. There, there can be up to uh, 300 candidates in every division. Uh, there are 22 divisions for EGU, so there are many candidates, also many awards, but nonetheless, uh, the um, uh, OSPP coordinator, it's working hard 
to uh, uh, um, select people and then the uh, president and other officer are, are validating it. Uh, the evolution, as I told you, from 2003 was from young scientist, then to student and then student and PhD. Uh, so all the time young people uh, in their career. Uh, basically now uh, everyone that is under PhD or which with PhD awarded after the 1st of January in the year of the conference can participate. Uh, the application is quite simple. Uh, you can change your mind. You can choose at the beginning when you uh, uh, submit the abstract, and but also you can change your mind and apply uh, also farther uh, at the time of the uh, letter of schedule. Uh, Basically, you will appear in the program as a participant. You can also post your uh, post a logo on the presentation or on the poster. When I say presentation, I mean mainly PICO. So you have two slides. Uh, there are also uh, um, stickers available uh, at TGU, and you can put them on the poster if you forgot a digital file. Uh, the selection is uh, based on judges, um, three judges per every, a minimum of three judges per every uh, candidate. Last year, uh, it was a very, uh, let's say, um, different thing because of the full digital uh, uh, EGU. This year, it's also something um, similar because we have a mixed one, but is only based on uh, uh, short presentations. But basically, uh, we need three to five at least uh, uh, judges to um, give scores for every candidate. Of course, there should be no uh, conflict of the interest, of course. Uh, the selection is, uh, uh, we are helped basically by the conveners. We ask conveners to uh, select judges because they know very well the, um, uh, let's say, the domain. Uh, but we can also uh, do it by ourselves. And then after the General Assembly, we see uh, how many um, uh, judges did their uh, job. Basically, the idea is to use the uh, oral, um, so the presentation made or the discussion made by the students. So the judges, they have to visit the poster or to attend uh, the PICO session, or in our case, uh, to attend the virtual presentation. Um, and after uh, that, we basically um, uh, see what are the scores and we decide I told you up to uh, six words. Uh, why does it matter? Because, of course, uh, as Dion said, um, uh, he's a recipient, so uh, it can be good for your CV, good for your, I don't know, uh, soul. Uh, but also, you get next year um, um, basically um, uh, cost. Uh, of attending EGU, they are raised for you. And also you uh, are invited to submit a paper uh, in an open access uh, publication where you also have the waiver uh, uh, fee uh, 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 raised. So it can be also a very good thing for, uh, let's say, um, your uh, finances. <laughs> now, uh, I will have only uh, one minute uh, speaking to you. There are some changes. Last year, basically, it was very uh, fuzzy. It was very hard to control things. So basically, um, uh, many people did not attend it at all. They just uploaded uh, presentations. Some uploaded material. So it was very hard for the judges to keep this uh, rule that they have to be present both uh, the judge and both the candidate. Uh, also, there was variability due to the virtual PICOs. This year, we hope that uh, everything will be very clear from the beginning. Uh, all the people that uh, can uh, 
participate will be flagged in the uh, program as OSPP participants. And again, we ask the convener to select three judges, but I will, for example, for natural hazards, I will try to go to five in order to have, let's say, um, uh, statistically speaking, uh, a better um, uh, evaluation. And also they have to uh, follow your presentation. Okay, so this is the main thing to follow the presentation. Also, they could in, engage with you in the uh, after the presentation in the question uh, part. So um, let's hope this year, let's say it 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 will go smoother than uh, than the last year. Also, very important. Um, what is evaluated, right? So there are four main keys aspects, relevance of the study, scientific accuracy, aesthetical appeal, and clarity of presentation. So you see, you have two things that are mainly related to the um, uh, research, uh, and you have two things that are mainly related to how do you present your uh, uh, research. Um, every criteria has a score between one to 10, and then we have a, a statistical mean that is um, applied to, to get the final, the final score. So this is it. It is a very technical uh, presentation. Good luck. And if you have any questions, I'm here for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miai, also for this last presentation. Now I leave the floor to Joanna that is going to, uh, to lead the Q&A session. So please, Joanna. Hello, uh, well, thank you for uh, your wonderful presentations. I have li like it very much. So I have uh, at least three questions from the audience. Uh, so the first one, I think uh, uh, we need some clarification from from uh, your part. So to complete, uh, uh, this one was from pra, Prakash Biswar Karma. <laughs> Sorry if, if I speak, <laughs> uh, I spell it wrong. <laughs> uh, to complete a uh, presentation in five minutes is a big challenge, as we all know. And I think uh, I talk with the experience that I also have some um, difficult to achieve. So he asked uh, some uh, tips to achieve this. What do you think? Do you want to start you to answer this? Some tips to do a presentation in five minutes. What, what, what is the question to? Is it? What uh, I think the the best question is: What will be the focus to achieve a a presentation in five minutes? Yeah, but who should answer? Me you, or you, you can. Me, say. okay, yeah. You can. No, no, I'm happy to. Uh, I just don't want to take uh, someone else's limelight. Um, okay, so presentation in five minutes. Well, I would say just focus on the interesting parts. Obviously, you're not going to cover your whole story from A to Z in five minutes. So what are you going to cut? Well, cut out the boring parts, cut out the details. If you only have five minutes, then the thing you should focus on are your interesting results. Um, just say what they are in very clear language and then show some motivation how you got to that answer or show some evidence or show some, some cool pictures or so and get people interested so they come to you later or look you up or um, interact with you directly because in five minutes you're not gonna tell them the whole story of your research anyway so just focus on the on the meat and uh cut out all the the bone from your presentation you can have one slide literally it's like just one picture and one line of text that's that just states what your main result is then you explain what that means and how you got to it and how people can reach you if you want to, to know more and i think that all already gets you far ahead of, of people who try to uh, cram a whole story into five minutes. I agree, I agree with you. 
Uh, what about the others, uh, Diana? Uh, I can say yeah. something. I, I I believe this question was uh, um, occurred mostly because uh, some of the sessions now are very packed with mini tiny presentations and there's like five seven and ten minutes presentations so five minutes is very short it's like the new format they call it pitch it's also a little bit of the initial presentation you give it pico right you just have to scream out very loud and then people will join you in your little uh, uh, presentation uh, place in the pico but uh, I, I don't know if uh, most of you already experienced that it's it's very nice presentation but i have to agree with uh, dion uh, you have to focus it to the top and uh, uh, to the to the, the most um, charming side of your presentation and then hopefully you catch the attention of your audience and they'll meet you after for a conversation <laughs> and then you can explain it in a more detailed way and that's actually a little bit a mixture between a presentation and a poster <laughs> just to try to find a date for later basically with somebody <laughs> but i think i think it's challenging but not impossible you need to be just very clear. And also, uh, one slide can be good. That was the format uh, some time ago also. But you can have like one, two slides. And not, not, not much more. Otherwise, you're, you're managing too much for a presentation of five minutes. You have to balance the, the work you do for the time uh, you, you talk, let's say. Uh, Mia, do you have something to add to this question? Yes, I, I remember one time a very big uh, um, uh, person in geomorphology came in from another continent, the TGU, and he didn't understood why only two minutes in, in, in those picos. It was crazy for, for him. But anyway, uh, I think this format actually uh, for the young people uh, it gives them, let's say, uh, a focus on improving their presentation because as a young people, for example, uh, I'm also teaching uh, the students, they tend mm -hmm. to uh, try to put everything in a presentation because, you know, they work a lot. So the tendency is to put literally everything there. So I think for the young people, it's, it's very good that they have to switch their view from this very wide uh, and very complete presentation to something that is uh, mainly suited actually for experts, let's say. But this gives them uh, time to think and to, to decide what to do. And this type of presentations of webinars or uh, sending them to uh, uh, useful resources like Dion show them that a very easy template or Diana explain them uh, different types of presentations. Um, it's, it's, it's very good for them. So I, I do not have a very specific, uh, uh, let's say, uh, something to, to tell about this, but it's very good that they, they, they have to think about this and decide by, by themselves. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you all. So the next uh, question is, uh, why is everyone, everyone using PowerPoint and none who's published? <laughs> is there any problem with publish? <laughs> uh, Kenyan uh, wants to start it, this discussion. Publisher is, is a tool for making paper products like, like flyers or, or, I don't know, I think you get what I mean. So it's it's more like a it's a publishing tool for um, for print products, which is fine. You can use it for presentations, but if you have publisher, you probably also have PowerPoint since you already have Microsoft software. So why not use the presentation tool instead of the print tool? So uh, if it works for you, why not? Uh, but I don't think it's a straightforward. Uh, Thing to use i've never used it and i've seen no one ever use it but maybe someone else maybe you find it much nicer than go ahead doesn't matter yeah yeah i agree 
uh, Diana and Mia, do you want to say something? Well, I, I think that this comes along a long discussion uh, uh, some weeks ago in Twitter about uh, what do you use to, uh, there was a long discussion about this to create your poster, I think. And there were people surprised that a lot of people use PowerPoints. So there was a huge discussion online. I think you can still search for it. And I'm guessing that the use of publish here, here is um, more appropriate for a poster, I would say, because it's a more static uh, thing. But, uh, um, well, uh, like Dion said very wisely, you just use what you feel more comfortable and you think it's better for you. <laughs> I think that uh, if in the end you can get the same results, the one is more comfortable and that, that uh, takes less time. Time is precious. <laughs> Oh, Lorenzo clarified he was referring to posters and figures. Well, I guess in this case, it makes more sense. Ultimately, I think my main point was just use whatever you know and what you're already good at. And then just value that you have a tool that you're, you're comfortable with. And all big tools support all the features you need anyway, so it doesn't matter. I think uh, it's yes. clarified. Uh, in, but in my yeah. point of view, yes, uh, Lorenzo has a point. Probably it, it also depends on your, let's say, previous focus, because I also had many students we are, which are proficient in very types of uh, software. And they also asked me, why don't we learn? Because, for example, I use very often Inkscape to uh, obtain maps and other things. And I told them, you can do it if you know it. The idea is that I present you something that is very easy. Also PowerPoint, as Dion said, comes with a lot of uh, computers already is there. Uh, I don't know, other uh, people that are, are using Linux, maybe they use a very similar uh, uh, software. So basically it's, it's a matter of training. Uh, but as Lorenzo is saying, usually in professional printing, yes, you use professional tools, but here you can keep it very simple. Everything can be, can be very simple. You, you do not have to complicate a lot. Uh, what are you doing? <laughs> Which is also the message. Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you. I, I can add uh, uh, also an answer to, to do posters. You can also use uh, PIMP, but uh, well, uh, you do what uh, what you are more comfortable to. So um, in the presentation, also from Lorenzo, uh, in the presentations, is it useful and recommend to include an outline at the beginning? Um, Diana, can you start for with that? Well, um, <clears throat> it depends again on your audience i think that in a eu presentation where if i will give i will give a presentation everybody already knows why i'm there i'm going just to give present one slide about the context uh, one sentence very brief one the one uh, the same one i used to put my voice in the tone that i really like and uh, a slide that I'm comfortable with. And um, <clears throat> yes, and uh, depends on the time available. If you have five minutes, maybe you can jump that part and go there. And the title should say it all at the first, you understand. But if you have a, a 12 minute presentation, you can dedicate some time to a, a proper introduction. That's, uh, that's, that's my point. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, the next question is, how do you respond when you don't understand questions from the audience, either because you don't understand the question acoustically, uh, because of, for example, because of uh, a dialect, or because you don't know the meaning of certain words? Uh, what do you, you all think? Do you want to start, Dion or Miyar? Well, it's, it's a very difficult situation because it's awkward for everyone, like for the person who asks the question, for the person, especially for the person who doesn't understand it. Um, and it's really dreadful. So in general, I would say it's best if you just stay, stay confident and not start. I mean, you have to somehow suppress your, your upcoming nervousness 
and just say, could you rephrase that? Or, uh, well, first, could you say it again? And then could you rephrase that um, so that people can say it in, in, in other words? Maybe as a rest, last resort, ask the panelists um, or ask the audience if they can explain the question to you. But if you've tried one, two, three times at most, then you say, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Why don't we discuss it after the talk? And then they can, can come back to you. Usually don't come back and it just goes away. Uh, but if they really want to know, then you can discuss it afterwards. And it's really spend the least amount of time on, on things like that and um, really try to, to stay calm and, and handle it. I can add a, a question to that. Uh, and if you don't know what to answer, what do you do? Yeah. Say, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think anyone benefits if you bullshit people for for a couple of minutes and, and bore them and, and the people who, who know that you're bullshitting, uh, you're, you're not gaining anything by that. So you can say, I don't know, this is how I would find out maybe, or this is um, something I could do to find out. But if you really don't even know what they're talking about, then I don't know, just say I don't know. It's, it's awkward, but it's better than all the alternatives. And you can also say, uh, please help me. <laughs> I don't know. We can discuss later. Suggestion? Please help me. I mean, you can keep exactly keep it positive, and then uh... because this is about in uh, this is what is about in conferences. You go there, you present, and even if you do mistakes, someone can help you. Actually, it's it's a real help. Yeah. You have something to add, Hienna? Well, I have uh, just tiny things to add. I think the end's advice was uh, very correct. I would, uh, if I don't understand totally, uh, I would just directly try to talk with that person later. Or, or maybe you can say your interpretation. So something like, if you're talking about this and this matter, it would be like this. So you're already giving kind of an answer if you suspect more or less, what to, but you give always a context, you know, like if you're referring to this specific point is this or something like you can be prepared, but it's, it's hard and um, it's okay to say, I'm not understanding or I, or even I obtained this result and I cannot explain it yet because we are working on this. And um, I, if you have some suggestion, please tell me. I did this in a, my first uh, EGU presentation as a first uh, year young researcher. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I got really nice feedback from the audience, people trying to help me to try to suggest, why don't you try this and that? And I think in the end, it can come uh, better feedback than you expected. Okay. Thank you. Well so um, my research is at an early stage in terms of quality of results and many wish to create interest in the audience experts in my field for more feedback and collaborations any suggestions out how, how you will do it and uh, has anyone have a short answer to because we are running out of time <laughs> Yeah, maybe a quick answer. Um, it, again, it's a pretty tough uh, situation, so you don't have anything to show for. But as, I still think you almost always you can find something that is interesting. If you have really zero things that are interesting, maybe you should just not not give a talk. Uh, but if you kind of well, you might have a plan that you think is interesting of how you might get to your results. Um, you might have some interesting data that you want to build upon. Um, you want to present something like a, a review of the field and like where your research would fit in there. You can do all of these things. It's, it's harder if you don't have results because you don't have like the, the candy to give to people to listen to you. So you need to find other candy. So maybe you have a cool picture of your data or so just so, show something, something interesting. No one likes to hear a detective story of how you uh, like want to arrive at, at the result or so. Just uh, draw a diagram, make something pretty that's nice to look at or so, um, of how you want to, to tackle these things and where you see the main obstacles. 
what problems you're trying to solve and stay result focused, even if you don't have results, like say what results you would like to get and uh, how they would fit into the field or so, things like that just, just to keep people interested and don't bore them with like a very detailed explanation of how you would do it or, or step by step or so it's, it's not going to give anyone anything. So you have to be a bit creative and come up with something that is uh, enticing about what you're trying to do would okay. be my advice, but it's a difficult situation. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your answers and questions. I uh, I think you are uh, all available to answer more if someone sent you an email. <laughs> uh, and I leave for the floor to Sylvia. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna, for this uh, session. Thank you, all of you, for your presentation, and even more for this discussion that has been really interesting. Uh, we are a bit like late, so I'm trying to be very synthetic in showing you uh, two last thing. Let me share my screen. That's okay. Let's go here. Yeah. So very briefly, before we say farewell, uh, just to let you know that we are planning some uh, uh, upcoming events inside our webinar series, inside the uh, Early Career Scientist Natural Hazard team. Uh, in particular, we are planning to have uh, uh, one event about the funding opportunities in scientific research in June, and another one focusing on challenges to be women in natural hazards and academia in September. In any case, if you are interested in saying being uh, updated about our activities, here, here you can find some details about our um, Twitter and Facebook uh, accounts. Uh, you can also register to our uh, mailing list. And uh, of course, uh, we invite you to have a look at our blog, the blog of our natural hazard division that is available at this address that I reported here. And also I would like to mention the fact that we are going to uh, publish, publish the keynotes uh, about this webinar also in a dedicated uh, uh, blog post. So you will find uh, also, uh, say, summarized all the interesting uh, concepts that have been presented today in a dedicated post. So that's all from my side. Um, thank you again, everyone, for participating, to the speakers for these presentations. And I hope that we will meet uh, very soon uh, at EGU, virtually or in person. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a nice day. Thank you.